All right, good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar. My name is Meg Beyer and I am part of the McSilver Institute's team. Um, I am really thrilled today to be joined by all of you and our wonderful presenters. Uh, for the first in our TTAC webinar series, a three-part series, an introduction to infant and early childhood mental health concepts and practices. Um, as I said, my name is Meg. I'm the Assistant Director of Strategic Operations at the McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research. And McSilver is one of the partners for the TTAC project. And I'm really thrilled to be with everyone this morning on today's webinar. Before we get started, just a few logistics about today's webinar. As we've done in the past, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted along with the slides to the TTAC website. So you can review it afterwards, share it with your colleagues and refer back to it. We will also be taking questions throughout the webinar and have time set aside at the end to answer as many of these questions as we can. For those questions that we don't simply get to, please know that we don't ignore them, we collect them all and our wonderful presenters We'll review them, and we oftentimes try and create a question document with the questions that are that go unanswered during the live webinar. Uh, the way we ask that you chat your questions in is if you look to the right-hand side of your WebEx screen, there is a chat box functionality on the right-hand side. We ask that you chat in your questions using the chat box functionality on the right-hand side of your screen. And we're collecting them all, so chat them in. Feel free to chat them in throughout the entire webinar. Um, but we are saving time at the end to address them. Uh, also, for those LMSWs and LMHCs interested in obtaining CEUs, uh, you must attend all three webinars in this series in order to obtain CEUs. Uh, further information will be distributed via email following the webinar series completion, but please know we are not able to give any partial credit so if you are looking uh, as an LMSW or an LMHC to obtain CEUs, you do have to attend every single webinar. Um, and finally, towards the end of the webinar, we will be sending out the feedback survey using the chat box functionality. So we will ask, you'll see that Kevin, my wonderful McSilver colleague who's helping us run our webinar today, is going to chat out a link. And we're going to ask that you click the link that's shared in the chat box and complete the feedback survey. Um, we know you probably get a lot of these <laughs> attending various trainings, but we really read all of them. We look at all the results and truly appreciate you filling this out as it allows us to understand your experience and enhance and tailor our future TTAC offerings. So with that, I want to thank you all again for joining us. And I will hand this over to Evelyn Blank, the Associate Executive Director at the New York Center for Child Development, to get us started. Evelyn? Good morning, and thank you, Meg. Um, can you hear me? Loud and clear, yes. This is Evelyn Blank, and I am the uh, Director of the Training and Technical Assistance Center, who is sponsoring this uh, series of webinars today. And I want to welcome everybody. Um, I wanted to start by just giving you some background about uh, the Training and Technical Assistance Center, which is funded through Thrive New York City, which is in partnership with the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. TTAC is a partnership between the New York Center for Child Development, otherwise known as NYCCD, and the McSilver Institute on Poverty Policy and Research. New York Center for Child Development has been a major provider of early childhood mental health services in New York, and we have expertise not only in forming policy, but supporting the field of early childhood mental health through both training and direct practice. And our partner and subcontractor in this grant is the NYU McSilver Institute for Poverty Policy and Research. And they house the Community and Managed Care Technical Assistance Center, otherwise known as CTAC and MTAG. Tech, and they offer clinic, business, and system transformation support statewide to all behavioral health providers. And this has been an incredible partnership, bringing their technical assistance along with our clinical expertise. TTAC is tasked with building the capacity and competencies of mental health and early childhood professionals. We do this through ongoing training and technical assistance. I'd like to direct everybody to our website where we list ongoing resources. Um, you can access our archived webinars um, and also find out about upcoming events. So we welcome all of you and we uh, invite you to join our learning community. 
So it is now my pleasure to introduce our presenters for these three series webinar uh, presentations. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Gil Foley, who's a longstanding colleague and a mentor of mine. Um, he is the clinical co-director for the Training and Technical Assistance Center. He is also a consulting clinical psychologist at New York Center for Child Development, where he's been that for over 20 years. He's also a member of our professional advisory board. He's a professor emeritus with the graduate program in infant mental health and developmental practice at Adelphi University. He is a retired tenured faculty member of the Furkoff Graduate School of Psychology, where he taught for over 20 years in the Department of School Clinical Child Psychology. He also coordinated the infancy early childhood track there. He was director of a federally funded training and technical assistance project that prepared infant and early childhood professionals across the nation. His clinical and teaching career have been devoted in large part to working with infants and young children with special needs in their families. He's also the author of several books and numerous articles. His most current book with Dr. Jane Hockman, Mental Health and Early Intervention, is published by Brooks. And he's got an upcoming book that he's currently co-authoring on sensory integration and self-regulation in young children, which will be published by National Zero Three. He lectures and consults widely. He's going to be joined in this series by Dr. Susan Chinitz, who's the other clinical co-director of TTAC. Um, she is a psychologist who specializes in the area of infant mental health and developmental disabilities in infancy and early childhood. She is the former director of the Early Childhood Center, the Center for Babies, Toddlers, and Families, and the Parent Infant Family Court Project. These were all therapeutic programs for children birth to five years of age at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine where she also was a professor of clinical pediatrics and the Patricia T. and Charles S. Raisin Distinguished Scholar in Pediatrics. Dr. Chinitz is currently affiliated with the Center for Court Innovation, where she is spearheading the Strong Starts Court Initiative, an effort to integrate developmental science into family court practice for infants and toddlers. Dr. Chinitz is on the board of the Zero to Three Network, the Community Advisory Board of the New York City Nurse Family Partnership, the faculty of the Parent Infant Psychotherapy Program at the Columbia University Center for Psychoanalytic Training and Research, and was previously on the local coordinating council for the New York City Early Intervention Program. She's been a member of the Foundation Frontiers of Innovation Initiative at the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. She has received numerous awards in recognition of her many achievements and outstanding work. So it is now my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Foley, who is gonna start off module one. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for that gracious introduction. And I want to thank my respected colleague, Dr. Susan Chinitz, um, who, with whom I've worked closely in developing this uh, three-part series, and uh, she will pick up uh, where I leave off. And we've really made an effort to have this be rather continuous flow and to dovetail, hopefully, uh, smoothly. And many of the ideas that I will introduce, uh, she will deepen and expand uh, in, in her portion of the, the presentation. So uh, again, I want to welcome so many of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I hope you are all well and working uh, to preserve your, your wellness, uh, reminding ourselves that we can cope uh, through this time of travail, uh, it will require patience and courage, and I think good natured resolve. So uh, there are two basic uh, parts to what I'm going to talk about this morning, uh, the principles of development and the principles of infant and early childhood mental health. Uh, I am going to um, attempt, uh, well, at each point, to pair a concept look at some concepts, and then look at their application uh, to actual practice. Uh, because I think so often we tend to think that ideas or principles theory that come from theory and research are, are inert. But they're really very important because they inform what we do. Uh, I used to think of them as a roadmap. I don't know that they're that specific. But they are like a compass. Uh, they they head us in the right direction, and they also give us a clue uh, if, we're, if we're off track. So I think these ideas um, are very real and very dynamic, and they have a tremendous meaning 
for what all of you do every day. So I am going to start with what is development itself. Um, it's the progressive physical growth of the organism, uh, the unfolding of capacities that we're born with, such as temperament, etc. the acquisition of abilities and skills over time, both quantitatively and qualitatively, in response to complex transactions between the child and the environment. That last point, of course, is the operational point, which I'm going to look at in a, a good bit more depth, because that really is the rationale and the foundation for what we all do. But I want to just explain this, uh, this progressive change, both quantitatively and qualitatively. You know, children, obviously, they get bigger. Physically, they get bigger, and they gain more skills and more complex skills. So that's the quantitative part, right? The growing, the more than. Um, but the qualitative changes really have to do with the kind of revolution that occurs in, in development as children uh, change the way they understand the world. So a child, before they're symbolic, they're very concrete and, uh, and very literal. But once they gain symbolic capacity, suddenly the world of imagination and a possibility is uh, opened up to them. Think about the child, the child who's on their tummy and creeping into the world. They're seeing the world from the, the, from the position often being on the floor, right? Uh, but when they get upright, suddenly they see the world in a dramatically new way. It's a perceptual revolution. So that's what we mean by qualitative changes. So it's not only getting bigger, it's not only getting more, but it's really this uh, dramatic change in the way the perception of the world changes. But I want to focus now uh, on that very important operative concept that development progresses in a gene environment interplay and is largely experience dependent. You know, we now know that it's certainly not nature and nurture or nurture. It's nature and nurture together. They are co-determinants of development. And experience is absolutely essential uh, for gene realization. You know, we used to have this idea that uh, we had a kind of internal time clock that was genetically programmed. And when the alarm went off, so to speak, we would talk or we'd get up right. We now know that, that those skills don't happen uh, just by the um, unfolding of genes themselves, that those genes become unlocked and become realized because of experience, because of the, the relationships and the stimulus nurturance of the world. So, if I can use a simple analogy, you know, the acorn contains the potential to become a mighty oak. But it doesn't realize that potential without rain, without sun, uh, without uh, nutrition from the soil. So it is together nature and nurture that is critical. And we know now, that heredity is not an unmodifiable determinant, but again, rather gene expression can be altered. We can change. And I would add to that not only genetic uh, and hereditary uh, factors can be changed, but even biology. Biology is not um, a destiny. And what I mean by that, many of the children we deal with have had biological insults. And yet, we now know that they can grow and change in very dramatic ways. I think also culture has to be always woven into this formula because culture also is a powerful and pervasive shaping force. Um, it changes and, and determines many aspects, for example, of child rearing, um, of nurturance, uh, expectations, and so on and so forth. While I won't be talking so much about 
cultural factors. I just want us all to keep in mind that we must understand cultural differences and we must respect them because they're powerful determinants. So with those two ideas, let's look a little bit um, of how uh, nature and nurture come together. Now, I've, I've um, given some examples here, um, and I may not go over all of them because I, I really wanted to talk a little bit about stories. I wanted to talk about real people in my life who have experienced transformative uh, events in their life because of this tremendous interplay of nature and nurture. So I want to introduce you to Maureen. I met Maureen when she was about three years old. Uh, she was born premature and she had a bleed and um, consequently developed uh, spastic diplegia, meaning that two of her limbs, her legs, uh, because of the uh, impact of the bleed, uh, had increased muscle tone and clearly might interfere with her capacity uh, to, ever, uh, to ever be mobile. Uh, later on in her development, she was discovered to have a, uh, a learning disability uh, that largely involved uh, language, uh, mostly writing, the, the interface between language and writing. Uh, and both of these uh, significantly impacted her life. She had the good fortune to be in an incredible family who loved her very much and who had many resources to, uh, to bring to her benefit and well-being. She also was one of the first children in my area to be in an early intervention program. Early intervention was in its infancy, and I had the good fortune to meet her and both to evaluate her and at different points in her life to be her therapist. And um, she thrived in, in, in early intervention. She had enormous amounts of uh, physical and occupational therapy because she also had many sensory differences. And it, it was amazing. She, uh, of course, did learn to walk. And really, uh, if you saw her today, you would probably not even notice that she has uh, had cerebral palsy. Her gait is uh, a very smooth. And uh, of course, she ambulates independently. Um, she progressed through school. Uh, she was not in special ed, but she did receive, and she was integrated through her uh, through her whole life. But she had, you know, reading support and and eventually uh, resource room support. But she ran into some difficulties, uh, sort of socially, and uh, and was struggling academically as she finished elementary school. And um, I had the opportunity to see her then for therapy and to uh, work with her parents. And uh, it was felt that she might make a better adjustment in a private setting. So she did go to um, middle school in, in, a, in a small private uh, situation, but it was not a special ed situation, but there were fewer children and she didn't quite have the same level of social competition. And then she did so well that as uh, she came back to high school, she came back to her neighborhood high school and again was, was integrated. When it came time for college, she kind of hit a roadblock and um, she was having trouble leaving home. She had a lot of separation anxiety. She wanted to go to a local college and live at home, and her parents felt that the separation would be uh, enormously helpful for her. So I had the opportunity at that point to see her in some therapy to help her with her anxiety um, and to um, help her to <clears throat> uh, imagine herself in these settings and to build her sense of uh, confidence. She went off to college. She uh, yes, she had resource room support there. There was a lot of uh, a lot of help, but she graduated quite successfully. Uh, she uh, moved back home. Now, as you might expect, she had a, she was trained in uh, 
uh, early childhood special ed. You know, many of us come to this work for reasons of our own. And uh, she got a job first as a preschool teacher. And eventually she became a supervisor in the early intervention program. But she kind of hit another wall. And she was living at home. And again, she wanted to move out, and her parents felt it was important for her to be launched. Uh, but again, she faced the same issue of confidence and anxiety. And she now comes back to therapy. And um, we worked together for five years. Um, and over that time, she was able to leave, live, leave home. She established a life of herself. Uh, and then her social life became an issue. She, of course, imagined herself being wanting to be married, and she thought that would never be in her future. Uh, she was very shy. She had very little experience with men. Uh, she had a lot of sensory issues, which she thought would complicate sexuality. Um, with the help of a wonderful uh, a female gynecologist, uh, she was able to explore some of those areas. And again, uh, hopefully through, through treatment, she was um, able to gain confidence and move forward. And it turns out she met a wonderful young physician. Uh, they married, and uh, she now has two wonderful children. So it's an amazingly powerful story. And, uh, it, you know, it also speaks to the environment, and it speaks to how biology in this case was not destiny. And how we can be diagnosably disabled to the imperceptibly disabled through the impact of family, of relationships, and of the environment, and of the kind of work you do every day. So you bring these opportunities to children and families so that genetics and biology do not have to be destiny. Now, I can tell you many more stories, uh, but for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to move on. I do want to uh, just point out to you my second point, that we know experiencing positive childhood uh, relationships has, has a great deal of power, but there's been a wonderful new piece of research that just came out uh, in uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2019 that really looked at a very large sample of individuals in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, now, of course, it was retrospective research and it, it was subjective, but they found that those individuals in the sample who had and can remember, could remember having positive childhood experiences, which were defined in very specific ways, even in the face of adverse childhood experiences, these positive experiences, were mostly relational experiences, actually were a kind of protective factor and significantly reduced the chances of them experiencing depression and other mental health factors in life. Uh, I think it's really one of the first large-scale systematic studies to demonstrate the power that early childhood relational experiences have. And lastly, I want to, uh, again, point out how uh, skill building, how feeling competent and masterful uh, really empowers children uh, to go forward. And that brings me back to Maureen. Because I've learned a very, very important lesson from her that I think has uh, meaning for all of us. When she came back to treatment as a young adult, between 25 and 30. One of the factors that uh, was a central theme in her treatment was she recognized all the help she had had in her life. But she really felt that she had never been allowed to fail. She felt that she had, that her whole life had been programmed for her and that she didn't know how to make decisions. And she was terribly frightened to be on her own. So I think the message is that, you know, in our work, we always have to leave latitude 
for children to have choices, to learn to fail, to learn to solve problems, and to give them the feelings of efficacy and confidence that will allow them to move forward. And one of the things I helped Maureen to see was that in spite of all the help she had, and in spite of the fact that her life had been programmed in a sense for success, she was the one who did it. No one else could do the hard work for her, whether it was the hard work in physical therapy, whether it was going for aquatic therapy as an adult, and also the kind of effort she had to expend as a supervisor in early intervention to write her notes, which because of her learning disability was no easy chore. Okay, so let's move on uh, from that springboard to some other principles. Uh, we know that development progresses in predictable patterns. Um, you know, we used to think it happened in a rather lockstep way in stages and phases. Uh, that model is not nearly so much uh, in vogue today because the research really suggests that development is much more plastic, much more flexible, so that ideas about pathways of development or dynamic systems or even chaos theory uh, become frameworks in which we think about development. Uh, but let's look at some of the predictable patterns. For example, we know motor development proceeds from head to foot. We have head control before we have uh, control of the, uh, the legs. Uh, development proceeds from the center of the body out here to the fingers, and of course, from gross to fine. Neurological development proceeds just the opposite, from the cerebellum to the prefrontal cortex. So it proceeds from bottom up. And developmental patterns include going from undifferentiated to discrete, self centered to other centered, and um, concrete to abstract. So let's look at how these principles uh, may help us in our work. So let's say, for example, a child who's having some fine motor challenges. I think so often we want to go right there to the, hand, to the hands, hand over hand. But this principle of the way motor development occurs gives us another clue. It says we might want to look at how stable the child is at the center of the body or the shoulder girdle first, because if they're not stable, we're going to have the extremities be challenged. For example, this, this idea of um, uh, starting with the concrete and going to the more abstract, we know, for example, for how brain development occurs from bottom up. We know when we're working on regulation, we often need to start with sensory co-regulation before we can promote self-regulation top-down through executive functions or cognitive inhibition or planning and sequence. So this gives us an idea about where to start and directions in which we can begin to uh, sequentially move our uh, treatment. Uh, we know, again, development progresses toward greater differentiation and complexity with capacities for abstraction, symbolization, and skill refinement. Um, children are concrete before they can deal with uh, abstractions. And I will never forget this story about the concreteness of young children. Uh, because I think it speaks to this, a, a, a preschool, uh, this was a, 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 an early preschooler, he wasn't yet fully uh, symbolic, and he was going to be um, a ring bearer in a wedding, and he was so excited. And after the experience, or during the experience, as he went to the, to the, uh, the practice at the wedding, he was completely crestfallen because he thought he was going to wear a bear costume. So he took the word bear uh, very concretely. So uh, we know, of course, later on, he could understand that uh, much more complexly. We also know that higher level skills or complex skills tend to be organized around uh, elements of 
uh, earlier or simpler skills. And of course, this is really the rationale for working developmentally, because we know if a child has too many holes in their early development, it's going to be harder for them to meaningfully uh, develop higher level skills. Now, we also know that development is not a continuous, even progression, that it goes in spurts and plateaus and even regressions. And regressions often serve to mobilize growth because we fall back to spring forward. Now I'm going to look at some applications of these principles uh, in our work. So when we think about concrete to abstract, we know in our teaching, we really need to use tangible references, concrete three-dimensional objects before or in conjunction with pictures or words. Right? I think too often we move too quickly to pictures. Children still need to hold the object, see it, move it. And as Sally Province used to say, the child has to heft the object to know it, meaning they have to get feedback through muscles and joints. We know, for example, often we use too much language in working with very young children. And we're always frequently apt to say first a teaching strategy of touching getting the child's attention, demonstrating, and then adding the words may, in many cases, be much more um, applicable. Uh, we teach from self-centered to other-centered. Children use their body, first of all, as their reality. So for a young child, tall is taller than they are. Farther is farther than they can reach. Children need to experience me and mine before they can uh, begin to share. Uh, again, the idea that we work on lower level skills and they inform higher level skills. You know, we sometimes forget that there's a lot that goes on in a child linguistically before they actually have words, before they can express. And that the production of language is, has elements in recognizing gestures, sharing intentionality and of what we call receptive language or comprehension. Um, so we also know, again, this idea that development can occur in fits and spurts and there can be regressions. We know sometimes, for example, a child mastering toilet training might become less uh, vocal or verbal while they're focusing their attention on that, sk uh, on that skill. And, um, a child on the threshold of becoming a preschooler might be a little hesitant, might be a little ambivalent, might seem a little shyer, might want to have the parent more close by, might have a little bit more separation anxiety as they're wrestling with closeness and distance, being grown up or being a baby, being dependent and autonomous. So regression is in of itself a bad word. Um, Susan is going to expand this, but just to point out that the lines of development are inextricably intertwined and interdependent. Strengths or weaknesses in one domain impact all others. Uh, you know, we tend to learn them as motor development, fine motor development language, as if they are independent lines or in silos. That's, that's not how development works, right? And uh, 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 I'm going to go to the application now to tell you how I learned this in the most dramatic way. Early in my career, when I was doing a lot of training in the transdisciplinary approach, <clears throat> and we used to train professionals in that model by actually assessing a child in what was called an arena evaluation, where the professionals of different disciplines were observing the same samples of behavior. And I will never forget, I was, I was the uh, psychologist on this training team, and we were assessing a child probably about 15 months, something like that. I was using the, at then, the Cattell Infant Intelligence Scale. And one of the items, a little sadistic item, uh, you, you stimulate the child with a sweet toy, and get them interested in it, and then you, you would put a, a, a glass barrier in front of it. Now, obviously, you wanted to get a sense of the child's frustration tolerance, their capacity for persistence, but obviously you wanted to see if they could solve the problem. Right? This little boy was determined as heck to get that toy, but all he could do was push the glass at the midline of his body. 
my PT colleague in the arena realized that this child was not very stable at the center of the body, nor at the hips, and he couldn't laterally flex because to get around the glass, you have to shift your weight and reach around it. If he did that, he was going to fall over and have to prop. So that wasn't going to help him. She came over and gave him a little stability at the hips. And you know what? He reached right around and got the toy. I learned in a very dramatic way that this was not a cognitive problem. This was a motor problem interfering with and compromising this child's cognitive capacities. We also know that development is both continuous and discontinuous. And what we mean by that is that, yes, early experience does future impact future development, but not exclusively. You know, we used to believe that what happened in the first five years of life determined who you were going to be. It was kind of all finished. We know that really is not true. Yes, early experience does cast a shadow. But there can be dramatic shifts in development, growths and changes in the course of development, for better or for worse, uh, in the face of new experience. So we know a great deal more about neuroplasticity and the capacity for change, just as I told you in the case of Maureen. So again, I, I did give you an example of the idea of multiple developments, but again, uh, another example. We know as children begin to leave the nest and they go out into the world to explore, which is absolutely essential to learning, uh, that exploration is best promoted from a secure base. You know? uh, if they have, know they have someone there who loves them and cares about them, uh, they can manage their anxiety much better and they're much more confident to leave that nest. And then when they get a little anxious when they're out in the world and they can come back and be reassured, refueled, they're ready to go out into the world. So here again, you see an emotional uh, milestone, uh, a secure attachment, really serves as an important catalyst for the ability to learn. We, again, must be attentive to posture and stability. That was very much in this example. And, of course, that's what I'm saying here. Uh, for example, the ability to find a desired object behind a barrier uh, takes an awful lot of motor skill. So we have to always think about uh, working in an integrated fashion, thinking about how what's happening in here is influencing that. And if something's weak here, how it might compromise that. The idea that development is both continuous and discontinuous, um, although we sometimes say uh, development tends to go as it starts, but we definitely know it need not. And it may take unforeseen, unforeseen shifts and enormous potential for change. We know, for example, a child who might have had a secure attachment or exposed to adverse childhood experiences under those kind of adverse conditions might wind up with an anxious one. And I think the case of Maureen, of course, speaks to how her biological insult uh, did not have to cast um, a shadow and how change is possible. I want to give you another very interesting uh, little story. And because I'm not so young, uh, I started my career in an institution for what we call then the mentally retarded and uh, the duly diagnosed individuals with mental retardation and uh, mental illness in many cases. You may know these institutions were, were rather grim places. And I, um, I was there just at that transitional period as we were moving uh, to deinstitutionalize uh, children and get them into the, into the world. And when I was in the institution, I met a very interesting uh, siblings, uh, Louise, and, Louise and Donna. Louise and Donna uh, were Siamese twins, and they had been born conjoined at the temporal lobe, and at that period of time, uh, they could not be separated. And of course, it was felt that parents were told there was no hope for these children, they would be hopelessly retarded, and the likelihood is they would not live beyond age eight. Well, the fact of the matter, 
when I came to the institution, they were late adolescents, um, and they had language, and they were they were doing pretty well, uh, but still suffering the effects of uh, of course of the inst of, of the institutionalization. And one of the twins was much bigger in stature, and the other's growth was fairly uh, stunted. So they uh, they had a specially designed walker where the the littler twin sat on a seat, and the the uh, other twin, who was bigger, stood up, and that's how they they were mobile. Well, of course, they defied that prediction right from the beginning because they did live, and they got deinstitutionalized, and they got some you know some finally some real intervention. And I had the opportunity to follow uh, uh, Louise and Donna. Uh, for a little while when they actually came to the community. So they were in the same community where I had lived at that point. And what was amazing is they were able to live for the most part relatively independently. They they were not in a community, you know, they were not in a community living arrangement. They they went into a high rise apartment that was for the elderly. It was not not a nursing home, not assisted living. It was a uh, you know, Section 8 housing for the elderly and the um, and the disabled. And they had been taught self-help skills. And for the most part, uh, they could manage all the activities of daily living. Uh, they needed some help with, uh, with grocery shopping and some of those things. And what was amazing is the larger twin, uh, Donna, uh, had quite a good voice. And she aspired to be a country western singer. Well, it turns out she actually gained a certain amount of notoriety in the local community, um, uh, singing for community groups and charities. Now, she was very conscious that she didn't want to, of course, they had to go together. Um, and, you know, there was the, she didn't want to, the, there was the sensational part. And she was conscious of that. But she really did have some talent. Now, you would have never known that possibility when I had seen her in this dire institution. So development doesn't necessarily go as it starts. It can make dramatic shifts. And that's what you and I do. That's what we do. And that's why we do it, because we know that is possible. We have the research to prove it, and we have lots of clinical examples. So this takes us to a very important part of how we bring the environment to the child. And we bring it in a relationship. That's the most powerful way. But we now know that development is relationship dependent. You know, Winnicott changed our view of the world from an individual psychology to a, at least a, a two-person psychology, if not more, when he said there is no such thing as a baby. There is only a baby in someone. And if I can be gross, a baby without someone is a dead baby because obviously we can't even sustain life independently. So we have to think relationally. We have to think relationally. We know relationships right from birth are two-way. There is serve and return. The baby sends signals. The parents send signals back. Of course, it's not an equal ratio, right? The parent has to do more. But the child has a part in its own relating and a part in its own attachment, which has survival meaning. Now, I will talk a little more about that in the Principles of Infant Mental Health, and uh, Dr. Shinnis will talk about that in her section. We also know that the single best buffer against toxic stress is having an emotionally available, sensitive, and responsive, reliable caregiver. And I go back to this wonderful research about positive early experiences that clearly that clearly demonstrates this. And of course, it is early care that impacts the formation of the brain. We know it isn't just a matter of character or personality, that early experience impacts biology and also epigenetics in the sense that the fullness of gene expression can only occur in the context of relationships and an enriched environment. Now, I just want to say about attachment, you know, attachment theory, we have about 60 years of research, uh, pretty powerful. It, it is, you know, there are some people questioning some of that, understandably, because it didn't take in the role of temperament 
It didn't take in the impact of social class, for example. But we do have a lot of um, data that has been uh, replicated. And I think we clearly know that having a secure attachment is no guarantee, but it is a powerful uh, protective factor. And I, this is old data, so 96. But a review of the data up to that time, Colin concluded that the picture of securely attached children that emerges from research is a positive one. They appear curious, self-confident about managing cognitive tasks, and persistent in the face of frustration and cooperative. So it is through relationships that we have attachment. So what does this mean? This means that everything we do needs to be relationship-based. We must build positive relationships, of course, with parents and with children, and that is foundational for all teaching and therapy. We must be fully available, sensitive, attuned, and responsive. We have to provide consistent, predictable, and reliable care, even when our clients may not be so reliable. It's important for us to keep appointments, to respond contingently. Provide an unconditional positive regard, even when the child's not behaving as we might like or the parent isn't responding as we want. We have to try to hold them as basically people who have potential. We presume potential. We must presume potential because that, I think, is in fact the truth. We promote play. And we foster schedules and routines that nurture a sense of security. I just want to point out, too, the physical care of the child is a powerful medium for intimacy, sensory experience, psychosocial development, and learning. So how important it is for us to promote a physical caregiving uh, as a developmental opportunity. You know, physical caregiving, uh, bathing, dressing, feeding. Toileting, you know, sometimes we, you know, we, they seem menial and we get kind of routinized, but those are, in, those are magical moments. Those are magical moments for serve and return, magical moments to be intimate, magical moments to give the child lots of sensory experience, magical moments to talk. And that's what we mean by relationship-based. We know parenthood is a developmental process. And I think sometimes we, don't, we, we tend to forget that. Um, you know, we're not born knowing how to be parents. I mean, we tend to parent the way we were parented. And we know that there's some very important research, Dr. Chin is not talking about this, but we know there's about a 70% concordance between the attachment classification of the mother and the attachment classification of the baby by a year. Now, that says a lot because it says that parent is probably parenting that child the way they were parented, and that's why they come out with an attachment classification like the parent. Now, that's not so bad if it's a secure attachment, but if it's an anxious attachment or a disorganized attachment, that's not so good. But we know parents can grow, and we know parenthood brings us new challenges, new developmental tasks and vulnerabilities, potential conflicts but it is also an enormous developmental affordance for personal growth, for learning new skills, including learning about ourselves, experiencing new satisfactions and fulfillment, and even repairing relational and developmental failures and losses on the parent's own part. By being a new object, by being a new way, keep parenting their child in a new way, it can actually have a um, a reparative function for some of their own um, challenges from their own childhood. So we know that parents can grow in the quality of their relationship with their children and become more skilled and effective parents. And this is really the this potential for change, again, is foundational for all our parent work. Right? It's this potential for developmental movement that helps us reframe our own attitudes and persist in the work because, you know, we all sometimes hit a wall and we think this parent isn't going anywhere and it's hopeless you know? and we need to refuel and recharge ourselves. But this idea of thinking parenthood is developmental, uh, a developmental process, I think helps us along the line. 
And again, it's the rationale for family-centered approach, for coaching parents, and for treating to the relationship and the goodness of fit between parents and child. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this idea, and, and Susan will too. Uh, in, in, uh, I'll talk about it in the principles of, of infant mental health. But we treat to the dyad and what goes on between them. Another important principle is that development is shaped by play, learning, and mastery. Play is a miraculous thing. You know, children will play, even children with disabilities, even children with autism. They will play. Their play might get a little stuck. We might need to help move them on, but they will play. And they will do it without the need for an imposed task. That's what's so marvelous. And Erickson said, play is self-healing. Self-healing, even if we're not making interpretations, even if we're not reflecting back, the act of playing itself is amazingly healing. And he said, it's like, you know, it's like us. We're, we had a bad day. We come home and we tell our, our spouse, a partner, whatever, about our day. And we feel we've unloaded some of that stress. Well, by playing, a child, in a way, is unloading. They're communicating. Uh, some of the stresses of their life. And of course, play affords opportunities for new class possibilities, plasticity, and resourcefulness. And uh, so playing is not to be underestimated. It's a powerful medium. And of course, we know the capacity for adaptation is acquired largely through learning. And uh, that's why, of course, learning uh, is so important to uh, helping us feel competent and masterful and being able to navigate the world. Um, so it's so sad when individuals haven't had the opportunity to learn, haven't had the opportunity to learn. And that was something that I learned firsthand by being in these institutions. You know, many of those individuals in those days in institutions uh, really shouldn't have been there. Now, I'm not blaming that generation. They were doing the best they could. And these, you know, given what they believed, given what knowledge they had, given what testing instruments they had, it has to be put in historical context. But I remember Dorothy. Dorothy was, uh, I met her. She was probably in her late 30s. Um, she was kind of a robust, uh, pleasant, uh, likable. She did have some language skills, but they were... Uh, pretty limited, and in many ways, her development was um, pretty much childlike. But she had never had She had been placed in the institution when she was about 18 uh, because her mother had been pimping her out, and she was arrested for prostitution. And, and in those days, if, if she had a measured IQ then, that was really just in the low average range. I mean, she wasn't even in the level of being uh, what we used to call them mentally retarded. But often in those days, rather than putting these individuals in a, in a in jail, they would put them in an institution, which I think was a possibly a more horrible uh, outcome than had they gone to jail, because you never got out of these institutions. And Dorothy was trapped in that institution where she spent days in a day room and was not learning. And I tested her as an adult. Um, and of course, at that time, she was coming out uh, uh, with an IQ uh, that was in the uh, moderately, uh, moderately retarded range. So here's someone who went in in the low average range and came out uh, in the moderately retarded range because she had never had the opportunity to play and to learn and to master. And that brings me uh, to an amazing study. Uh, that we sometimes forget. It was done by two psychologists by the name of Skeel and Dye. And it was done in the 1930s. And it had kind of disappeared in the literature. And Sam Kirk uh, kind of revived it and made us look at it again and actually went back and looked at some of the individuals. <laughs> some say it actually is, was one of the, one of the powerful uh, impetus for early intervention uh, becoming a legal, a legal reality. Let me just quickly tell you about skill and diet. 
So we, we probably couldn't do this today. It was done in Iowa in the 1930s. And he took a 13, two, two uh, institutions, a, a, an institution for children who uh, had been, uh, fought, had, uh, parents had, had died, and they came into uh, uh, institutional care uh, at the children's home, and an institution for the mentally um, retarded. Was, and it was, they were both on a, you know, they, it was one of these, uh, in those days, often you had all your institutions on one uh, sort of uh, kind of um, park-like uh, setting. So, he didn't believe the idea then that IQ was immutable, because we did believe that then. You know, it was a given biologically determined quantity of capacity, and it didn't change. He didn't believe it. So he got the, uh, he got this, the, uh, the, county, uh, uh, the, uh, the county officials at the time to agree to do a radical experiment. And, you know, it was interesting, it was in Iowa. A lot of these, these guys in those days were farmers. I think they knew something about behavior and behavior change by watching animals. He said, listen, let me take 13 of these babies who are coming into the institution who already have IQs that are being measured in the mentally retarded range. Let's take 13 of them and give them an opportunity to play every day with the adult mentally retarded women in the institution. Just play with them because he knew in that instant that orphanage, they were not getting handled. They were not getting stimulated. And he said, let's look at those 13 kids and let's look at another uh, sample of 13 kids in the orphanage who came in with IQs in the normal range and let's see what happens. You know what he found? That the kids who had the experience of every day getting to play with these adult women, mentally retarded, but play nonetheless, their IQs went up at the end of the study. And the kids who entered, the babies who entered the orphanage functioning within normal limits, what happened to them? Their IQs went down. It was a very, very dramatic study. And, you know, they, they, they presented their research and uh, they, they were highly challenged. People said that uh, they, they fudged it because the prevailing was belief, belief was that you couldn't change IQ. In fact, they really were on the threshold of early intervention. And it was very important. Sadly, it happened just on the, the cusp of World War II, and then Skeel went to the went to the service. He was in the war, and sadly, because of the very negative experience he had had professionally uh, uh, when he came out of the war, he chose another professional work. So, back to early experience. And we also know that individual differences are more the norm than the exception. Every child is entitled to look different and there's a wide range of variants with under the umbrella of uh, the range of what we would call typical so again uh, i already gave you some of the implications of uh, the idea of play and learning but again uh, just thinking about play we want to follow the child's lead in play we want to join the child at their level we want to expand play skills we want to promote peer play, and we always want the child to tell us, and often they tell us about their world and their experience through their play. And of course, I like to think of play as a dress rehearsal for life, right? In play, children imagine themselves to be doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, right? And Erickson put it this way. Encourage it, it, that play encourages imaginative anticipation of future roles played out with toys and costumes in tales and games. From the point of view of learning, a big part of our job is to consider what experiences are appropriate for a particular child with what frequency, with what dose, and timing, and the timing to facilitate learning and recognize that children, for example, with different temperamental styles are entitled to behave very differently. Right? For example, when we say, get your bodies 
quiet and calm, get regulated, right? A feisty child's body in a regulated state is entitled to look a little bit different than a slow to warm up child. So I'm just going to pull these principles together because uh, we have a good bit to do. Uh, nature and nurture are co-determinants of development and development is largely experience dependent. Development progresses in predictable patterns, not necessarily lockstep, stage and phase, and if you miss this stage, then you won't do that stage. Much more flexible, but still predictable patterns. Higher, more complex skills are synthesized out of the components of lower level skills. Um, there is a certain um, a cumulative dimension to develop. The lines of development are intimately and inextricably interlaced and interrelated in an interdependent fashion. Development is relationship dependent. Parenthood is a developmental process. Development is both con continuous and discontinuous. Plasticity is normative. Development is shaped by play, learning, and mastery, and individual differences are more the norm than the expectation. So building on these fundamental principles, uh, I'd like to move now uh, to uh, infant and early childhood mental health and some of these important principles. So what is infant mental health? Infant mental health is a body of knowledge, practices, and strategies derived from multiple disciplines because it's cross-disciplinary, relationally framed again, and aimed to promote optimal self-social emotional development in infants and young children to prevent developmental derailment and to intervene and nurture development back into within the range of mental health uh, when it has gone off, off, off path. So two definitions from important organizations, zero to three defines infant mental health as the developing capacity of the child from birth to three to experience, regulate, and express emotions, form close and secure interpersonal relationships, and explore the environment and learn, all in the context of family, community, and cultural expectations um, for young children. Infant mental health is synonymous with healthy social emotional development, and that's why uh, next time we're going to climb the social emotional developmental ladder. The World Association of Infant Mental Health describes uh, it as a field dedicated to understanding and treating children, we now say zero to five uh, uh, years of age, within the context of family, caregiving, community, and relationships. So let's look at some of these principles. I just want to emphasize. Uh, because social-emotional factors are key to mental health, that we really know now from a large body of literature that social-emotional development, synonymous with infant mental health, and sometimes referred to as non-cognitive skills, formed early in life, are pivotal in increasing the likelihood of healthy personal development and future success in the workplace as well as adult well-being. Now, that's the continuous part of development. I just want to point out a recent study, 2015, I think it's quite striking, following 753 kids from kindergarten to young adulthood, and they want to see what were sort of consistent predictors of uh, uh, academic success, um, employment, criminal activity, substance abuse, mental, mental health. And you know what they found? Kindergarten teachers rating of, pro -so of their pro-social skills. So it really tells us that uh, social emotional development is integral. And of course, all learning is duly coded. There's a, always a cognitive piece, of course, but there's an emotional piece. And I often say, to, make, to point that out, if you think a moment about three of the most important events in your life, my guess is that those events that are going to be evoked in your memory all have a very powerful emotional charge. Not necessarily always a positive emotional charge, but an emotional charge, which says that if the emotional component has uh, really encodes information in a very, very powerful way. We know educational attainment and predicting future success in the workplace are dependent on more than cognitive ability alone. 
Non-cognitive characteristics such as self-discipline, motivation, interpersonal skills have significant predictive power and explain a big part of what will become academic and workplace success. So uh, thinking again about emotions, I want to just spend a little bit on self-regulation, particularly affect regulation, because that's one of the aspects of, uh, of emotions that seems to be very, very, very important in predicting success. So what is self-regulation? Well, uh, it's the child's developing capacity to flexibly modulate and grade reactivity to sensation. So there's a, there's a sensory piece, affect arousal, and emotional piece, and behavior. Um, Great, you see, it's not all or none, black or white, you're not on or off. You can have the appropriate response to the appropriate situation. So we behave and respond, let's say, in a library differently than we do on the playground, okay? We have, um, uh, we have a range of possibilities. And we do that in support of goal-directed actions across a broad range of functions, and when, the, when we are dysregulated, we can recover back to the regulated state. And no one is regulated all the time. Now, I think there is, again, a message in that uh, in terms of uh, practice. I think one of the, the messages is, yes, we want children to be regulated, but we don't want them to be too good. We don't want them to be regulated all the time because if they're never dysregulated, they're never going to have the opportunity of how to practice to get themselves back together. And that is a huge part of um, self-regulation. When we think of regulation, it too, like everything else, is a developmental process. Um, and it tends to uh, go in three basic uh, chunks. Early on, it's external regulation. You know, the parent has to pretty much regulate the infant. Now, they can do some state regulation, of course, but we know they can't even regulate their own temperature, right? We have to bundle them up, keep them warm. We have to help them stay content. Right? So it's pretty much from the outside. That gives way during, uh, you know, in, in, in to, the, to the preschool years, um, uh, up to through toddlerhood, what we call mutual or co-regulation, right? where we give the child incrementally more opportunity to get themselves regulated. And then from about two years on, there's still lots of co-regulation, but it moves incrementally toward self-regulation so that by about uh, three, well, by about really more like five, the child now can start to use executive functions or top-down means to self-regulate. Again, just as we said in, in development, infant and early childhood mental health is relationship-based both in concept and practice. And attachment is a core concept. Uh, I, uh, Susan will be going into that more. Uh, at, its, at the heart, attachment has survival meaning. And I'm going to paraphrase Bowlby, who, who's the father of attachment theory. He used to say, you know, there's nothing, uh, there's, it's common sense. If you're in a dangerous situation, right? let's say your, your car, uh, you're on a, on, a, on, a, on a road, you have a flat tire, it's late at night, that's a dangerous situation. Well, let's think of infancy. Relatively speaking, infancy is a dangerous situation because the child is so helpless. So you're in, in, in this dangerous situation. Your chances of survival are vastly increased if you're with a responsive, reliable, and competent companion than if you're alone. That is the common sense definition of attachment, why it's so important. We know it has various parts. Uh, attachment behaviors are what we know babies do. These are inborn face gazing, social smiling, sucking. These are evolutionarily determined. But at this point in evolution, we think their power is that they're signals and they bring a caregiver into proximity because proximity is the important part, closeness for protection and security. And infants are active participants in their attachment, largely who serve in return. But attachment itself is an enduring emotional tie to a particular individual. And I want to emphasize a particular individual. 
uh, uh, the attachment to one significant person, adult caregiver, can be different from another. So we have to understand attachment to each particular individual. We now know children, of course, can have more than one attachment figure. The research suggests, however, that they tend to organize themselves somewhat in a hierarchical fashion so that there's sort of always some primary person at the top. Remember, we talked before that the attachment figure serves as a secure base, this emotional anchor for the child to learn and explore. And the infant develops a sense of what is expected and what is possible in relationships by being in a relationship. And Bowlby called this our internal working model, largely unconscious, but it's the kind of expectations and the kinds of uh, uh, an anticipatory uh, feelings we have. So if we anticipate, for example, that we're all gonna be abandoned, that we might play that out based on this internal working model. Or if we think we have to be totally self-sufficient, we may get on a trajectory of becoming a loner and feeling like we can never depend on others. So the early expectations grow out of our real relationship with those very important people in our lives. Again, relationship is core. The application of this, and I'm gonna quote my, my mentor, Sally Province, in a sense is don't just do something, stand there and pay attention meaning being emotionally available, listening carefully with full attention, but not always feeling compelled to act. You know, sometimes we feel we have got to do something. We have to make it better. But sometimes making it better means being there and listening carefully, sitting on our hands. We believe in infant mental health, that parents know their child the best until proven otherwise. And that means we give parents the benefit of the doubt. We allow parents to tell their story and we let parents teach us about the child. We put ourselves in the role of a learner. The ability to make no assumptions about the family and monitor our judgments. That doesn't mean we may not need to make qualitative assessments, but we're careful. You know, again, from my experience, I remember his mother, I was a late preschooler doing the interview and, you know, she was still bathing him and still dressing him. And, you know, you could easily go, oh, she's an infantilizing mother. She's enmeshed with this child. She can't let him grow up. You know what some of the reality was? This child had such severe motor planning problems that getting dressed was a monumental task. And in the morning when she had to get out to work, she couldn't help him learn to dress himself, it just was easier to dress him, right? And it really had little or nothing to do with infantilizing this child. Infant, infant mental health, we try to identify and support strengths in the parent-child relationship. It is strength-based, remembering that parenthood is a developmental process. We treat not Oh, to two individuals, but we treat to the relationship. We treat to what goes on, what we call that zone of goodness of fit between a parent and child. You know? So the parent may, who has unrealistic expectations, who has developmentally appropriate expectations given the, where the child is, or maybe where the child is given their disability, we try to get them on track. We try to get them so they're not two ships passing in the night so they can connect. This is what we, in part, what we by goodness of it. We, of course, attempt to address the concerns of parents, impart skills, and to support their capacity to develop as parents. And we want to feel with the parents and the child. And remember, sometimes parents may be grieving the loss of the child they wish to have. That is all part of what it means to be relationship-based. And we have to tolerate and stay regulated ourselves in the face of strong feelings. Strong feelings are a part of the work. This is not easy to do. Beyond suggested, you know, we have to be kind of a container. We have to hold the feelings for the parents. Not overreact. Not overreact. Because by not overreacting, by holding the feelings and co-regulating the parent, we're saying to the parent that strong feelings 
do not have to destroy you or destroy me. They can be manageable, managed. And I always think of Fred Rogers' wonderful statement, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. We want to maintain an optimal professional distance, neither so close as to distort our judgment or compromise the self-sufficiency of the family, nor so distant as to be, uh, uh, or to prevent us from having empathic support. So, of course, we need professional boundaries. Without it, we could not do the work. We'd be eaten alive. And there are times we have to be able to, we need to make hard decisions, reporting a family to ACS giving families bad news. This does require professional boundaries, but it's not an absolute boundary. I mean, it has a boundary with some latitude. Sometimes we're a little closer, we hold the parent more, we support more, and other times when the parent is beginning to exercise self-sufficiency, we move back and we give them a chance. So think of that professional boundary as having a little bit of elasticity. And we recognize that the way we relate and treat the parent and child has the power to shape the way the parents treat and relate to their own children. We call this parallel process. We are, can be very powerful models. We treat the parent with respect and dignity. There's a better chance that parent's going to treat their child with respect and dignity. Jerry Paul, uh, another important figure in our field, said, do unto others as you would have others do unto others. So there's kind of a chain, right? And we can get the chain going. It's like a positive side of the slippery slope. It's the positive slide of climbing the slope. And it's very important. And we also need to recognize and decode how the past can be reenacted in the present relationship between the parent and child. Now, uh, Susan's going to talk more about this, but this is the concept of the ghost in the nursery. That sometimes unfinished business from the parent's own past does can get reenacted with the child. Right? Because, you know, as much as we know babies tell us, there's a lot they don't tell us. And so we fill in the blanks. And sometimes we fill in the blanks from our own past experiences. Sometimes not so good ones. So we want to understand how forces out of awareness impact the present. And Selma Freiburg called this the ghost in the nursery. Um, and Susan will be talking a little more about that, so I won't uh, go more. But that is a key concept. You know, what, what, how does, what are the attributes the parent has for their baby? Very important to keep your ears at them. Is this baby an angel? Is this baby a blessing? Is this baby a devil? Is this baby greedy? Is this baby just like that, that his father who abandoned me? So what does the parent attribute to that baby? What attributes? And that can also give us the clues as to what ghost may or may not be up. And lastly, infant and early childhood mental health is reflective practice, which we hopefully refine through reflective supervision. Reflective practice means that we try to do our work mindfully. We try not to give the knee, the knee jerk response. We try to find a helpful response. Right? Um, and that means sometimes we hold ourselves back and we think about the situation. We think about what feelings are being triggered in us, but we hold them, we contain them. That's reflective practice. And reflective supervision helps us. We're going to be having a TTAC webinar on reflective supervision. Uh, regretfully, it was to be done by the late Dr. Rebecca uh, Shamran Chanak, and sadly, she recently passed away. She was really one of the uh, real pioneers in uh, the development and propagation of reflective supervision. Uh, back to Jerry Paul, how you are is as important as what you do. Being in touch with our own feelings and recognizing how they impact us and our work. 
and again, substitute impulse and reactivity with mindful responsiveness. These are the aims of reflective supervision. Reflective supervision helps us to become a reflective practitioner. Self-observation through reflective supervision promotes self-monitoring and mindfulness. And just as I summed up the principles of development, I'm going to sum up the principles of infant and early childhood mental health. Promotion, prevention, and intervention are the key components of infant and early childhood mental health. Social emotional development is the organizing theme of infant and early childhood mental health. The ability to experience and regulate emotions and behavior are important to adaptation. The centrality of relationship based both concepts and practices are really at the heart of infant and early childhood mental health. The ability to be emotionally available is a key practice principle. Assume parents know their child best until proven otherwise. Practice through a strength-based lens. Treat not just to the parent and the child, but to what goes on between them, that zone of goodness of Maintain an optimal professional distance, a flexible balance between closeness and distance. Remember that parallel process, do unto others as others would do unto others, is one of our most powerful therapeutic tools. Be attuned to how the past colors the present, how forces outside of awareness can impact behavior in the present, the ghosts in the nursery. Exercise reflective practice and participate in reflective supervision. And if it is available to you, and if it isn't, I urge you to uh, uh, do what you can to make it available. To you. And again, always consider and respect cultural differences. Well, that ends uh, the two modules this morning, the two parts of module one this morning. And next week, uh, Wednesday, not next week, we'll be moving on to module two. I will open up module two with uh, climbing the social emotional developmental ladder. And then Dr. Chinnitz uh, will pick up and begin to look at when development does go astray and when it is no longer within the scope of typical and what that looks like, how you can identify it. And we'll also deepen and expand some of the principles of development and infant and early childhood mental health that I reviewed today. So uh, we don't have too much time left, um, but um, if there are any immediate questions, uh, I can field or maybe one or two, and we will pick this up at another time. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for today from uh, the Mixover team. Thank and you, I Mary. just wanted to say thank you so much for your presentation. I learned so much. I am so appreciative of your knowledge that you shared. Um, before we get to one or two questions, I just wanted to ask my colleague Kevin to chat out the feedback survey to everyone who's on the line at the moment. Um, and if folks, as while you're listening to the questions that um, we're going to read, if you could just take a minute and respond. There's not many questions. Um, we're just kind of asking to get your feedback and see what your interests are potentially in future uh, training offerings as well. So, and as, as Gil said, we look forward to the final two components of the three-part webinar series that will take place later this week. So, um, Evelyn, did you want thank to you. run through any of the questions? Yes, thank you, and thank you, Gil. That was really a tremendous, a lot of material, a tremendous presentation. So we have a few questions. Um, the first one is somebody was wondering about co-regulation between a caregiver and a child ages two to four years old. And the question was, how can this skill become a treatment goal? Um, and they were wondering, particularly in the context of trauma, where there is some uh, physiological dysregulation, how can the therapist help their little one develop this awareness about their physiological state? Well, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, I think that uh, I think our OT colleagues can be uh, of, of help here uh, because I think that often in trauma, um, 
you know, you have behaviors that sort of mimic uh, some of the same behaviors that you might see in uh, uh, in sensory processing disorder. And a colleague of mine, Paul Boz, and I, she's an OT, uh, we, we talk about it as a, that in, often in post-traumatic stress, it, it has a piece of it that is a, an acquired disorder of arousal, right? So I think uh, looking at the body and what the body is doing and helping the child often to get sensory regulated is a prelude to getting emotionally regulated. Because, you know, sensation and emotion are really are often very, very closely linked. Uh, many affective states are, are associated with um, a certain types of sensory experiences that we have had. Um, you know, if you're feeling quite excited, uh, you might associate it with just having been to a dance. If you're feeling very sad, it might be associated with a sensory experience of, uh, uh, let's say, of having um, the sensations of being at a funeral and um, the, the somber tones, etc. Uh, so I think one way in to co-regulate the child is being attuned to the sensory state the states of arousal, and beginning to see how you can organize the child, what kinds of inputs can upregulate the child or downregulate the child. So the child who is hypervigilant maybe needs to be downregulated, the child who is uh, somewhat dissociated and trying to uh, numb uh, and mute the feeling can gently be upregulated. So I think these are important clues. And I just want to say this relationship between affect and feeling uh, I think our language often, you know, our language often gives us clues, and certainly in American English, we do use the word feel to be both a sensation, right? This feels smooth, and I'm feeling a little less anxious now that this presentation is, is uh, uh, coming to a close. Thank you, Gil. Okay, another question is that... Many of the children in the families you work with experience multiple stressors, which are even worse than coronavirus. Do you have recommendations about how we can support children's development when families are dealing with so much stress at this point? Well, I, I, Dr. Chinnis will be uh, really looking at this um, in, in, in more detail. There are two things that immediately come to mind. One is that we know stressors are cumulative. So the number of stressors are sometimes more important uh, to consider in terms of impact than any single stressor. And I go back to, uh, it comes out of a, a, a very important uh, a center for the developing child that Susan has had involvement with at Harvard. The single best buffer for toxic and excessive stress is having an emotionally available, reliable, sensitive and responsive caregiver. So we're back to the relationship. And I think part of our job is to hold and nurture the parent so that they can be that kind of sensitive, responsive, and reliable parent to the child. And particularly in a time like this, I think we all need to be held. Right? And also recognize that some, certainly some degree of anxiety and disquiet is also normal. Uh, at a time uh, like this, for example. So uh, I think we also have to differentiate what is average expectable reactivity to a stressor and what is, uh, you know, begins to move out of the, uh, the range of mental health. So we're at a really want to thank you, Gil, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, there are a few more questions, and we will respond to people who have um, submitted them. Uh, some of them are around attachment and how uh, a child being removed from the parent or foster care is impacted by that. This is a real area of uh, Dr. Chinnis' expertise and yeah. one that we will absolutely be covering in the following uh, webinars. So please do complete the survey. I thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Gil, for a wonderful and really rich presentation and we look forward to seeing you in the next two uh, modules so thank you all thank you bye bye bye